Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us today is Ryan King. He is the Vice President, Corporate Development of Caliber Mining, which is exploring for world-class gold, silver, and copper deposits in Nicaragua. Mr. King, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you very much, Maurice, for having me. You know, we're honored to have you on our show. Sir, for someone new to the story, who is Caliber Mining, and what is the thesis you're attempting to prove? Well, thanks, Maurice. Yeah, our thesis really is um, it's twofold. One, we're exploring for, as you mentioned, world-class discoveries in Nicaragua, which has had over 8 million ounces of produced gold in this district that we're exploring. And secondly, we've recently gone through a restructuring. We've added some new people to our team. Uh, we are trying to duplicate what we've done in our last deal called New Market Gold, and that is go out and buy advanced stage development or producing gold opportunities and optimize those operations, uh, spend money on them, drill them, find more resources, and potentially look to merge or sell the company after we've spent some time and money uh, adding value to the company. So twofold. Uh, Nicaragua, we believe, is optionality right now, and we're this team has uh, has done very well in the past acquiring, advancing, optimizing, and selling projects. We hope to do that again. You know, you referenced Nicaragua. Provide us with some historical context on the region in which your project portfolio is located. For those who don't know, uh, Nicaragua has it does have a bit of a checkered past. It's gone through um, different political situations. It's gone through through uh, uh, different civil war uh, during the uh, 50s and 60s. There was a significant period of time where there was um, no mineral exploration. It was uh, it was a country that was difficult to work in. Um, however, over the years, um, we've had we've seen gold developers and gold producers go there, Falcon Bridge, um, and others. Uh, and th and there's been some great uh, gold development. There's been some great gold production. We have a couple of uh, projects around us and actually within our portfolio that has produced multi-million ounces, uh, produced copper. Um, so it's, it, but, but it has been underexplored for a number of decades. And currently, the, the president of Nicaragua is Daniel Ortega. He's been in power for quite a few years now. And, um, and so it does have a bit of a checkered past, Central America, uh, just underneath Honduras. Uh, but it is on the ring of fire, and what I mean by that is uh, there's been numerous copper gold porphyry systems found all along this ring of fire that is a well-known uh, sort of phrase that's used within the geological and mining community for large copper gold deposits that have been found, big porphyry type systems that have been found on the ring of fire, and that's what attracted us there. We were able to pick up this uh, land package from Yamana in 2009. Uh, they had recently done some restructuring themselves, and I believe they had recently merged with um, a, with, a, with a company back in 2007, 2008, and so they were looking at doing different things. There was no production in the portfolio there in Nicaragua currently, or or was there any at the time that we acquired these? These are just exploration projects uh, around and within concessions that has seen historical production. Caliber's flagship Barossi project has district-scale discovery potential in Nicaragua. Where are your projects located, and how much of a land position does Caliber have there? So the projects are located, uh, I believe you just mentioned, northeast Nicaragua. So um, we, we, take, uh, we take a flight into Managua, which is the capital of, of Nicaragua. We then take a flight that is uh, run daily from Managua up to uh, either Rosita or to Bonanza. Um, so Barosi actually is is originated from Bonanza, Rosita, and Sayuna, the three towns, uh, the three mining and mineral exploration towns um, in, in our concessions. So that's where Barosi comes from. And yeah, we have a very large land package. Um, the one thing we have in our land package, however, is uh, we've brought in some significant partners. I mean, this size of this land package, uh, over 800 square kilometers, is so vast. And in today's market environment, it's very difficult for small cap juniors to explore 
uh, so many different targets. We brought in partners, I am gold, Centera gold and Rosita mining a, a junior company to help us uh, advance these projects and explore the numerous targets that we have. Mr. King, we've covered some good background. Walk us through your flagship Barossi project. The flagship project is, as I mentioned, northeast Nicaragua. We have 400 square kilometers, 100% owned uh, in these concessions. And they're all abutting to or, or very closely adjacent to each other. We have a, a joint venture with a small junior called Rosita Mining. This joint venture is a uh, past producing SCARN deposit, produced over 300 million pounds of copper. We have a joint venture, which is now 51-49, 51 for IM Gold, 49% owned by Caliber. Um, this is with IM Gold. IM Gold is now currently drilling on low sulfidation epithermal vein discoveries. They have an option to go up to 70%. And then on the Sayuna Gold project, we have uh, an option earn in with Sentara Gold. And Sentara as well can earn in to 70%, very close to their 51%, their first earn in. And they're, and they're exploring for large copper gold porphyry systems. They're also exploring for uh, SCARN deposits. And that's exactly what the La Luz past producing mine was, was a, was a SCARN deposit that produced over 2 million ounces of gold. Expanding the narrative on your project portfolio, Caliber Mining has low sulfidation epithermal gold silver deposits. What has the company excited here? Well, yeah, you brought up low sulfidation epithermal deposits, and that's exactly what we're seeing over tens of kilometers based on the geochem anomalies, based on the LIDAR surveys that have been done with IM Gold on the Eastern Ferrosi concessions. What gets us excited here is just the vast amount of underexplored nature of this region. What gets us really excited is the fact that quite often when we do our geochemical analysis and we identified new anomalies, uh, we're seeing a good correlation to the drill results. Um, anytime we've had uh, good geochem anomalies on surface, and, and that would be a, a, an identification of a gold-silver vein, quite often underneath that, we are finding high-grade gold over one to up to 15 meters of width. And for an underground type gold system, I would say uh, at a bare minimum, what you're looking for is something between two and five meters running anywhere from four to four to, uh, to eight grams per ton gold and gold equivalent. And that's going to get you a very good, we believe, a very good identification of, uh, of, a, of a good underground gold system. The nice thing about these epithermal veins is they're outcropping quite often. And so we're able to identify them on surface. And what, you know, on a preliminary engineering basis, what we could see here in some of these systems is that you have potentially a small open pit that would transition into an underground ore body. And the nice thing about what we have here at Eastern Barossi is we have numerous veins swarming as well as parallel veins that you could see a, a multi-phase, uh, multi-ounce uh, production scenario from uh, from a sh uh, from a small distance, and yet, over and over, we're seeing, as I mentioned, tens of kilometers of strike length, tens of kilometers of parallel veins, and uh, we we just think there's a huge amount of opportunity to expand on the current 800,000 ounce resource that we have identified there. Before we leave the La Luna Gold Silver deposit, we have some breaking news. Can you share the details with us? Absolutely. We announced uh, some additional drill results with our partner IM Gold. These uh, the, IM Gold has been a very solid partner. They've been continuing to earn in annually. Um, we run the program there. We identify the targets and then we work with IM Gold to confirm that we should proceed and, and drill a number of these targets. And today we announced 8.7 meters, grading 6.8 grams per ton gold equivalent as well as 4.5 meters grading 7.29 grams per ton gold equivalent. So these are some of the highlights. 
But that meshes in very nicely with what I was just mentioning in terms of widths, in terms of grade, what you're looking for in these types of systems. One of these, I believe it's the 4.4 uh, meters grading 7.2 grams per ton gold, is a brand new discovery that we've made there. So this is, this is north of our La Luna resource, uh, about 100 meters. We've also identified a long strike and about 400 meters to the north. On surface, we're seeing excellent uh, geochemical anomalies running multi ounces on surface. So we, we believe that this, this could lead to quite an extension to the zone and very likely and potentially a good, a good size increase in resources when we do calculate resources. This is all outside of current uh, 2018 43101 resources that we did earlier in the year. So we're very encouraged by this uh, and we think this is going to be a very beneficial impact to the company going into 2019. And last but not least, Caliber Mining has the largest gold scarring deposit in the district, the Lalouse deposit. Walk us through the deposit. Sure. I mean, uh, we we uh, we never obviously operated this. This was operated decades ago. Uh, but um, you know, one of the big important aspects of of any sort of mineral exploration is to go and and discover and explore around past producing districts and past producing gold mines. What brought us here and what got us excited about this is the potential at La Luz. So La Luz, as you mentioned, was a past producing gold mine, produced over 2 million ounces of gold, and from all uh, documentation we've read was, was very profitable. So this started at surface. Uh, this was uh, a high-grade SCARN system uh, that started by very large trenches and morphed into um, into a high-grade underground gold mine. Now, I can't remember the exact year that this happened, but um, the hydro dam broke and flooded the mine. And uh, I, if I recall, there was hundreds of thousands of ounces down below where they had finished their mining and stopped mining due to the flooding. So there, there's probably north of 500,000 ounces uh, that could be mineable ounces below uh, where the, the mine is currently stopped and, of course, flooded now. So myself, our executive chairman, Russell Ball, and Greg Smith were just in Nicaragua. Uh, we drove by this. It's right on the edge of town. Um, again, these are, these are um, past-producing mines. So these towns, in this case Sayuna, is very familiar with gold mining or any mining of that nature, M very mining-friendly locations. Um, so what we've done over the last little while, instead of dewatering and trying to get back in there and mine, is look for additional resources outside and around La Luz. Could you dewater? I think that's quite a potential. Could you then get back in there underground and start to look for more ounces? As I mentioned, there was, there was hundreds of thousands of ounces left by the previous miner. Um, but what we've focused on over the last little while is trying to find and identify additional SCARN deposits in and around La Luz. We do currently have, uh, adjacent to La Luz, a 750,000 ounce gold resource. We've been doing some drilling around that. We've been doing some drilling down strike from that as well in the Hurricane District where approximately a couple of kilometers down strike to the south We've had some good, what looks like porphyry type uh, mineralization coming into the uh, to the system. So lots of potential in and around La Luz. Um, again, our partner there is Centera Gold. We're getting close to a 51-49 joint venture now, and they have an option to earn into 70 percent. And uh, we'll see. I mean, we're at the end of 2018. We've been drilling a number of targets, uh, not only Cerro Aeroporto but a number of targets along the whole 253 square kilometers that is optioned uh, to Centera Gold. So we'll see where we decide to drill next year. There's just so many different targets uh, along this whole trend that look interesting to both Centera and ourselves. Mr. King, we've referenced three different deposits and three different joint venture partners. Multi-layered question here. Is there active drilling on all three of these deposits? And what is the predominant relationship with the joint venture partners, is that their focus only is to drill? 
Good question, Maurice, uh, and thank you. So actively right now we have two drills, two diamond drills, turning with I am gold and have been uh, just about the, 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 the whole year on the Eastern Barossi concessions. So, and, and as a reminder, Eastern Barossi have over 800,000 ounces identified in an inferred 43-101 resource. As I've mentioned, we've had, over the course of 2018, drill results come out that are all outside, predominantly outside of those resources. So two drills turning all year and, and currently have two drills turning. We just put out the results today from the La Luna Gold Project where we've identified new resources, or sorry, not resources yet, but new mineralization outside of the current resources. Earlier in the year, we identified a project in the Barossi concessions with IM Gold called Veda Loca, which is outside of resources. And there we drilled 7.4 meters, grading 9.7 grams per ton gold equivalent. We identified resource. Uh, we identified new zones outside of resources at La Sapresa or Cadillac, where we drilled 4.1 meters, grading 10.5 grams per ton gold equivalent. So a lot of activity with IM Gold is underway. There's just so many different targets on the Eastern Barossi concessions, and that's where IM Gold has earned into 51%. They have the option by spending another five million dollars to earn into earn into 70%. As well. In our 100% on ground, Caliber drilled a couple of different targets, the San Francisco target, um, the San Isidro target, all around Primavera. So as I mentioned, Primavera is uh, a very classic copper gold porphyry system. These porphyry systems are lower grade, but they can get to be very, very large, hundreds and hundreds, if not billions of tons of, of mineralization running you know between 0.2 and 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 point uh, 0 0.8 0 0.9 one gram per ton if not more uh, gold and you know anywhere from 0 0.2 and up for percent copper so we we are drilling what looks to be like a 25 square kilometer porphyry district area that have a number of signatures that look similar to primavera this year we drilled uh, I believe we drilled about uh, 20 to, to 30 holes. And uh, and as I mentioned, we we have identified lower grade mineralization over long widths, but we haven't gotten into a new higher grade system. Uh, so currently we're not drilling. We did a drill program this year. I think it was about 2,000 meters. And so what the plan is for Primavera and our 100% owned district now is we have identified numerous targets. Uh, we've just recently gone through a corporate restructuring. So what we'll very likely do at this stage is now that we've dressed it up and, and as I mentioned, identified a number of targets, we'll look to bring in a partner very likely on Primavera or, or Minnesota um, and, and largely due to a function of the market. Uh, we've recently raised $5 million. Um, we're looking at uh, a bit of a strategic and, and uh, shift within the company not just explore in Nicaragua, but also look, because we have a very well-known team, look to look to acquire additional opportunities for advanced stage gold or production opportunities. So we'll look for a partner on Primavera and some of our 100% owned projects. And then thirdly, with Sentera, uh, Sentera is spending $9 million to earn into 70% on the 253 square kilometer Sayuna concessions. And what they're looking for, again, are these copper gold, big copper gold porphyry systems, multi-element porphyry systems. We did drill up in the northern part of our district at El Avion, and we're waiting for drill results from that. We are currently drilling right now, so there's activity on the ground with Sentara right now, and they're drilling a project called Rescalete, which is uh, around the center of the concession. And these are all drilling following up on geochemical anomalies that have been identified there. So the whole almost 250 square kilometer land package had been sampled, sampled for gold, silver, copper, and looking for concentrations on surface and then following up with, with drilling. And so right now they're drilling the Rescalete uh, gold target, gold copper target. 
and we hope to have results. Uh, I don't know that we'll have them by the end of the year, probably early 2019. So there's still a lot of activity happening, even though we're at this late junction of the year. Now, Ryan, for someone that is not familiar with the mining jurisdiction in Nicaragua, tell us about it and also share with us, how is the company positioned as far as permitting? Yeah, great question. Always a very important question when looking at investing in, in exploration companies. I mean, if you can find multi-million ounces, but you can't advance those multi-million ounces to a mine and production, uh, it, it, it's worthless, really. So a very good question. And for Caliber, so Caliber has been in Nicaragua since 2009. One of the things that we're all focused on here is unlocking value. And one of the reasons we chose to go to Nicaragua and specifically chose to acquire these Bonanza and Barosi concessions is largely because this is a past producing district. This is a mining district that has produced over 8 million ounces of gold, 300 million pounds of copper. So these towns of Bonanza, Sayuna, Rosita are very familiar with mining. In fact, one of our partners, Rosita Mining, has been doing months and months of work to advance uh, a permit in uh, in these concessions on the Rosita concessions that we're in joint venture with. They've recently received their permits to build a treatment plant, a treatment plant that will process all the past stockpiles from the uh, originally producing Rosita mine. So, um, you know, because of the past production nature, these towns are very familiar with mining. And actually, for the, um, the local artisanal miners, it's very important for them, artisanal miners and mining there where they're following some veins and chipping away at some rocks and pulling out some more, it's important for them and part of their, uh, for their daily lives to, to find mineralization. So as long as you can work very closely with these communities, and we have been closely working with these communities for, for a number of years now. You build up long-term relationships. We also have um, a very connected and well-known lady that works with us, Angelica, who has been uh, in, in country, I believe, most of her life, working with these different villages and communities that, uh, that we're, we're involved with. So it's really taking the time and spending the time and educating, uh, talking about socioeconomic benefits working with local communities uh, on a daily basis, uh, really. And, and that's what it takes for drilling permits as well. It's not just permitting to build or permitting to advance a project towards production. It's also um, a very strict mining law in Nicaragua, which is, I believe, very important. And they've never uh, bent the rules. They've never changed the rules since we've been there. I think this is important because they're following very strictly to the code of conduct and the mining law that they have in place. And that might speak to the president. President Daniel Ortega was the son of a miner. I can't recall exactly which mine he was born at, but it was La Libertad or La Limon. Um, those are the two main mines, gold mines, in the country. Those two gold mines produce between 100 and 150,000 ounces of gold a year, and they have for decades and decades. And they're owned by B2 Gold, our largest shareholder. They own 12% of caliber mining. So the country is very familiar. It's a very significant uh, contributor to GDP. I believe it was somewhere between 3 and 4%. The gold helped uh, the economy and growth in GDP. But it, it, you know, the important aspect here is that they do very follow their mining law very closely. And so for drilling, you need to go through consultation with community, they need to uh, apply for permits for drilling. They need to come out and check the sites and work with the communities, regulators, uh, making sure that we've done all of our consultation work and CSR work. So they, they do follow that very closely. And, and we think that's great. We think that's very important. And we've had never, never one time have we had any issues in country with getting permits, um, renewing concessions, anything like this. So we, we think so far it's been a, a good place for us to do mineral exploration. Very favorable response here. Tell us about existing infrastructure and what this means for shareholders regarding capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another good aspect about advancing a project to become a mine. 
um, very similarly, like if you have no relationship with communities and, and you can't advance a project um, with community support, uh, very similar to infrastructure. If there's no infrastructure around and infrastructure is needed to be built by government or by companies, it's going to take a lot longer. So luckily in Nicaragua, a lot of different advances have been made over the years. I believe the current president, Daniel Ortega, has done a good job of building infrastructure, um, has, has expanded foreign investment into the country. And actually, uh, to bring that up, there's been a Chinese group that has been doing engineering work and evaluation work on building a new canal through Nicaragua. I, I believe have already spent upwards of $1 billion to look at a way to bring a canal through Nicaragua, uh, through one of their very large lakes they have, central Nicaragua there. So that indicates, firstly, that, that foreign investment is welcome. Secondly, one of the exploding industries in Nicaragua has been tourism. You talk to different people around the world and Nicaragua has be, has has become a, a place, a destination of, of vacations. New hotels have gone up. Um, new resorts are there. So it's become a place very much like Costa Rica where people want to go on vacation. It's a big surfing town outside of Managua. So there's been a lot of different foreign investment in real estate and development and, and hotels. So on that topic, in terms of infrastructure, um, our CEO, Greg Smith, has been to Nicaragua for, for years. He was there early 90s, and he recalls the roads being very, di very terrible, uh, very difficult, long, long, bumpy roads. Whereas now, he's noticed a very vast difference in a lot of the roads have been paved, a lot of the roads have been fixed. So road infrastructure has changed drastically for the better, all the way up from Managua all the way up to northeast Nicaragua where our projects are so so excellent roads Additionally, he's noticed now all of the communities Rosita Bonanza Sayena all of the communities are on the hydroelectric grid So and they're continually upgrading that we noticed when we were just there new brand new power lines so it's just a matter of stringing those lines up to the power grid and, uh, and they'll have new, brand new power. So you can see all of the developments that are happening there, the pro developments that are happening there. And I believe it's, it's to help attract foreign investment into the country and connect all of the different communities to the electric, electrical grid within Nicaragua. So from that standpoint, I believe the, the current administration has done a very good job of advancing their infrastructure, even though Nicaragua is one of the, if not the second, poorest country in Central America. Mr. King, before we discuss the management team, are there any reversionary interests and or royalties on the Barossi project? Yes, yes there are. To the government, there's a 3% royalty. Um, and, and on our 100% on Primavera project, I believe it's a 1 or a 1.5% 1 additional royalty to B2 Gold. Other than that, um, uh, other than the government's 3% royalty and, and uh, I think it's 27 or 30% tax rate, nothing else. And any reversionary interest, sir? No. Okay. And are there any redundant assets such as a patent mining claim? No. All right. And uh, you've referenced this before, but just for the record, what is management's philosophy? Are you looking to build a mine or arbitrage? Yeah, this is an important question. I think this dovetails uh, very well with our strategic plan. I believe I've mentioned this, but our, our last company, um, and, and, and I'll just start by this. Everyone on our management team and our board of directors has been involved in mining for decades. This team has been involved with discovery of multi-million ounce deposits through to uh, acquisitions. This team has been involved in raising significant hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. This team has been involved in development stage projects that go on to feasibility study and then become a mine. This team has been involved in royalty companies that have gone on to transactions that see financial windfalls for shareholders. And very recently, 
majority part of our team was involved with a company called New Market Gold. So New Market Gold, as I mentioned, was a large portion of our team on caliber mining. New Market went out and acquired three producing gold mines. These gold mines were located in Australia. At the time, New Market had a exploration project in Newfoundland in Canada. They did a strategic switch looking for and, and, and we believed and do and do again as well that timing is critical. So this happened in 2015, the beginning part of 2015. We felt that the uh, opportunity within the landscape of uh, the gold producers and the gold price, roughly around $1,100 gold at that time, was the right time to go out and acquire production and hopefully find ways to optimize them. We did that. We found three producing gold mines in Australia, one of which was called Fosterville. And in each one of these mines, we had recognized that not a lot of capital and not a lot of exploration work had gone into some of these mines. We immediately talked to all of the local and, and uh, ground geologists. There was numerous targets. We immediately uh, deployed a program of exploration drilling on each one of these projects. And we had success. We found very high-grade extensions, particularly to the Fosterville gold mine. And for those uh, that are familiar, we advanced that on, grew the resource, optimized the mine, and went on and did a merger with Kirkland Lake Gold. Kirkland Lake Gold has been one of the darlings in the gold space, if you can find a, a bright spot in a difficult market. Kirkland Lake has had well over 200 and 250% returns for shareholders since that transaction. And a lot of it has to do with Fosterville. This Fosterville mine has become a very high-grade underground gold mine that is producing well over well over 200,000 ounces of gold a year, a very low cash cost. So it's been an incredible win for our shareholders. So this team, what we'd like to do, again, is because we feel now is the time to be acquiring either producing or very advanced stage gold opportunities. We think now is the time, just because the disinterest in the sector, the gold price has not been bad. It's We're sitting around a little over $1,200 gold, but the price to net asset value in so many of these different seniors and mid-tier gold producers is very low, multi-year multi lows. So we think it's a great opportunity to take advantage of if we can acquire the right deal with the right capital structure. So short term, we're looking at optionality and long term, we're looking at arbitrage. Is that correct, sir? I believe so, yeah. If we can execute on our plan, which I believe we will, this optionality in Nicaragua and we have over 2 million ounces of defined resources there with great partners. And then at the same time, if this management team and, and board of directors can execute and acquire quality opportunities, uh, we think, yeah, this is, this is going to be a great arbitrage opportunity. Switching gears, I learned from some of the most serially successful in the industry, ranging from Rick Rule, Doug Casey, Giant Bandari, Mickey Fulp, and Bob Moriarty, that the people running the business are equally, if not more important, than the latent material in the ground. Mr. King, please introduce us to your board of directors and management team and the unique skill sets they bring to Caliber Mining. So first and foremost, um, our executive chairman, as I mentioned, he comes from Newmont and Gold Corp, really ingrained into the business for decades. Um, he was the chief financial officer at Gold Corp mo most recently. Uh, he's now our executive chairman. Um, and, and, and the vision is tied to this. Um, now that we've restructured the company, so we've recently gone through restructuring, we raised $5 million, 42 million shares out. Uh, approximately today, December 2018, uh, market capitalization of $15 million. Um, it aligns with our plan of going out and, and buying production or acquiring production through the gold corps of the world, mid-tiers, seniors. Um, hopefully, we'll find a way to find the right opportunity. So, Russ is a, a fantastic addition to the team and huge relationships within this business and, and uh, absolutely knowledgeable, intelligent gentleman that knows what he's doing. Douglas Forrester, uh, Masters of Science in Economic Geology. Doug is, um, is brilliant at merging the science and, uh, and resource aspect of companies with capital markets. Um, Doug has been very successful with the Hunter Dickinson Group 
Bob Hunter and Bob Dickinson way back in the 80s where they discovered uh, Mount Milligan, a big copper gold system, and went on to sell that. And numerous other projects in 2006 bought back the Mount Milligan project that had been undeveloped, advanced it through permitting and feasibility study, and then sold it to Thompson Creek. And then, of course, his most recent success, the founder, one of the founders and uh, president CEO of New Market Gold that went on to sell for a little over a billion dollars to Kirkland Lake. Huge, huge asset within this company. And one of the primary reasons that I'm part of this company and part of this group is, uh, is because of Doug and his, um, his, his experience, his expertise and track record speaks for itself. His partner uh, and director, Blaine Johnson, both Doug and Blaine are founders of Caliber. They were also both founders of New Market Gold, as I, as I mentioned, that we were very successful there going on and, and advancing gold production towards a place where we felt it was value add to merge with another company, Kirkland Lake. And Kirkland is now a $5 billion company and I would say one of the darlings in the business. Blaine was a, a, a stockbroker for many years, raised hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars for different publicly traded companies. And so Blaine is now uh, working with, with Doug, their, their uh, partners, looking for new opportunities to acquire advanced gold production, uh, or sorry, advanced gold development or gold production. And Blaine also brings a, a, a huge Rolodex of relationships within the business. Um, Doug Hurst was uh, one of the founders of International Royalties that sold to Royal Gold years ago, did very well on that. Of course, Doug was also one of the founders of New Market Gold. So an incredible geologist within our, our group, very analytical. Doug looks at uh, projects, looks at spreadsheets. He was an analyst within the business for many years. Ed Ferrato, uh, also one of the founders of uh, Terrain Metals, which uh, which was in 2006 acquired the Copper Gold Mount Milligan project. Uh, he was also one of the founders with Doug and Blaine and, and Doug Hurst of New Market Gold. So incredible, again, relationships and knowledge within the regulatory space and corporate governance. George Salamis, uh, some of your listeners will, will may, may know, uh, he is the founder of Integra Resources. Uh, he was the um, he was the chairman of of Integra Gold. I'm not sure I might have had those flipped around. I can't remember Integra, <laughs> but uh, George, yeah. So we we uh, very closely worked with George over the years, and George, of course, sold uh, Integra to uh, to El Dorado for uh, uh, well north of 400 million dollars, I believe. Again, um, somebody that's been in the business for many years. He's a geologist and understands the capital market space, and of course. Uh, has eyes and ears within the industry looking for opportunities. So uh, a very well-connected board. I, I didn't mention Greg, but Greg Smith, uh, he's, um, he's a geologist, been working in Latin America, Central America for, for decades. Um, one, of the, one of the companies he had incredible success with geologically and on the ground was with Rosoro Mining. And Rosoro had the uh, gold projects in Venezuela. Fortunately, Venezuela didn't work out so well, however, Greg went on to find tens of millions of ounces there in in, uh, in Venezuela and has um, has really a track record of being able to find multi-million ounce deposits. So he's very much uh, one of the geologists that's probably, in from, from what I've known in my 15 years of this business, one of the best at finding uh, new discoveries and advancing and finding more resources. And we're doing that, uh, as you can see, in Nicaragua. I will just mention one other individual, a uh, strategic advisor, uh, he's on our strategic advisory board, Darren Hall. And Darren comes with uh, decades of experience with Newmont. He was the chief operating officer with us at New Market Gold. He was overseeing thousands of employees when he was at Newmont uh, in Australia. I think he was the general manager of Boddington, one of the larger open pit underground gold mines in Australia. And Darren... Uh, is is uh, very willing to roll up the sleeves and work with us again on the next new opportunity that we come across. So we're, we're privileged to have somebody of his expertise work with us uh, work with us again on on hopefully will be uh, sort of a new market two scenario. Tell us about Ryan King. What makes him qualified for the task at hand? That's a great question. It's sometimes difficult to look in the mirror and answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess what I can say is um, 
you know, I've been in this business now for better part of 15 years. I started back in 2000 and, uh, 2003. And right out of the gate, I was privileged enough to be able to work with Doug Forrester, um, a team from uh, an ex Placer Dome team that had been through course production and development scenarios. One of the, the first companies that I really got ingrained into was a company called Terrain Metals. Um, I've got a, a business degree, but I was able to learn on the ground, in the office, through uh, geologists, through engineers, through uh, CSR specialists, how to really take a, an operation, optimize it, advance it through the permitting stages, advance it through um, all the financing hurdles that you need to go through to build a mine. Um, and, and throughout my career, I've spent days, hours, uh, on the road with different CEOs with different skill sets. I believe that I've really learned um, what works and what doesn't work in terms of, of opportunities within the space, um, what people are attracted to, what people like, what, what and, and, then, and then very, very interestingly, w when things turn, when, when markets turn, when there's wind in our sails, when, when to uh, allocate more capital to get the story out, um, so, uh, yeah, I guess it's just 15 years of experience on the ground. Luckily, I've been involved in two, two acquisitions. One, the Terrain Metals, which we sold that company to Thompson Creek for $750 million in 2010. And then uh, another big success was our New Market Gold that we sold for a little over a billion dollars, both of which I was ingrained right from the beginning. Worked very closely with the whole team, all the team. And... Uh, really trying to unlock value, getting the story out on different channels, institutionally, helping raise capital, uh, retail, um, and then any different ways to, to add value through corporate development, um, through new relationships, through strategic alliances and, and strategic shareholders. Um, that's my skill set. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just basically the experience over the last 15 years in seeing the value that, uh, that we look for in particular assets and merging that with capital markets is one of my strengths. You know, there's a, one of those unique intangibles that you have an opportunity to be with that intellectual capital behind the scenes is something that you don't learn in, in the world of academia. You just have to be there. What can you share with us about the technical team? Yeah, well, we'll start. I think I shared a little bit, uh, particularly Greg and his skill set on the ground. Um, Greg, Greg is the president CEO currently of, of Caliber Mining. He has been since, I believe it's 2010. Again, a very experienced geologist. Um, he oversees all of the technical aspects, geological aspects of the project. He's, uh, he's got his fingers in every piece of the puzzle uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, Greg is, is very ingrained in looking at new opportunities, looking at the geological potential, the upside potential very much on the ground you know as i mentioned we were just in nicaragua greg uh our, our executive chairman russell ball and myself um kicking rocks uh, meeting the drillers looking at uh, the geological maps and potential in country we have a very seasoned project geologist mark siance he was with barrick for a number of years left and and started working with us in nicaragua so he's our number one expat that lives and works in Nicaragua full time. Uh, excellent geologist um, has has helped us identify new discoveries and and and, and grow resources there. I mentioned Doug uh, Forster, uh, an incredible database of knowledge this gentleman brings um, with his experience over decades of looking at different projects, seeing what works, what could work, what doesn't work. Being a master's of economic geology adds a lot of value, but then being able to merge that with the capital markets aspect and what could help unlock further value is, is such a tremendous school, um, tool. Raymond Threlkeld uh, put mines into production, um, Ray's a geologist as well. He's looked and, and identified new targets all the way from grassroots right to advanced exploration to be able to add value. A geologist, Doug Hurst, a geologist, um, Darren Hall, a chief operating officer with decades experience, not only with operations, but uh, but the human capital aspect is an important part of it. Such an important part, especially when you're overseeing thousands of employees. And Darren brings a tremendous amount of expertise and experience on that. So 
we, we've got a very well-rounded team with accountants, geologists, engineers, um, <coughs> and I believe that it's the right mix for us when we go and we do make an acquisition to uh, to be able to identify the good targets, the good the good projects to potentially bring into the company from multi-level aspects, all the way from uh, additional exploration potential, um, engineering and mine optimization, through to the various levels of regulatory and accounting details. So it's a good mix of a team. All right, sir, we've covered your deposits, we've covered your people. Tell us about your capital structure. Sure, today, um, December 2018, 42 million shares issued and outstanding. We've recently completed a $5 million capital raise, a small private placement that we did at 44 cents. We did that with Sprott Global, with Rick Rules Group. Um, I believe Rick has identified us as a group that has been successful in the past. Um, nice optionality with joint venture partners in Nicaragua. Um, one of the things I think that, that stood out for Rick was management's ownership. I think this is very important anytime anyone looks at a very risky early stage exploration, even development stage company, is do the management, the board, the founders, do they own stock and do they own it by buying it in the market? So often you'll see different groups that own stock, but they may or may not have, have ever bought that stock. It may have been granted or gifted. We actually have hard dollars into the company. We've bought 10% of, of our shares um, in, in the market or in private placements. We all participated in the last round of the financing at 44 cents. So we, we want to see this succeed. And um, even recently, uh, you look at insider filings, you'll see uh, some of our directors, myself included, buying shares in the market because oftentimes at the end of a year, at the end of a difficult commodity cycle or a year, you'll see tax loss selling. And we've been seeing that recently, currently trading at about 38, 39 cents a share. Um, and, and we all just believe it's a great opportunity to acquire additional shares in the market given the tax loss pressure all resource companies have seen. We've got about 1.2 million options at uh, at $1.38, so quite a bit uh, higher on average out of the money. As I mentioned, we're trading at about $0.38 cents a share. And then uh, average warrant price is, is, is a little over a dollar as well. Um, so yeah, and we've got about just a little under $5 million in cash with a, with a very relatively low burn rate given that we're not going to be spending any money drilling on our 100% on projects in Nicaragua in the, sh in the short term. We, we just think the better value opportunity is to continue to look for additional either advanced stage gold projects uh, or uh, or production opportunities. And uh, and uh, they're, not, they're not easy to find. Yeah, they're not easy to tra transact on. But because of the depth of our relationships, I believe that we'll be able to pull it off. You know, for our members of our audience, I want to underline, underscore, and foot stomp when Rick Rule and Sprott Global Resource Investments, when they commit capital, that should get your attention as well. Um, I will just quickly touch on two more shareholders that we have that I think is, is prominent and important. You mentioned Sprott and Sprott Global, Rick Rule. Uh, it's very worthy of paying attention to smart, educated, well-known investors like himself. We also have a 9% shareholder, Lucas Lundin. Lucas was a board member with us at New Market Gold. He was a significant shareholder of that company as well. And in addition, 12% uh, shareholder is B2 Gold. B2 have um, projects all around the world. But in particular, they have two producing gold mines in Nicaragua, where we're currently exploring. So good shareholders to have, well over 30% here. Uh, is owned by, or just a little over 30% is owned by people close to the company, management, and a very solid, well-known uh, mid-tier gold producer, almost a senior gold producer in B2 Gold now. Talk to us about the cash flow distribution. Is it going to be used predominantly for optionality here? For the time being, given the, the landscape we see in the resource market, particularly the gold market, we, we believe it's best preserved. Um, and used for, let's call it due diligence, looking at new opportunities. Um, it, does, it does require capital, even though we have a great team of technically experienced 
good director and, and management uh, people. Uh, you always need to hire third parties to to help analyze and, uh, and assist in seeing if an opportunity has any red flags, uh, seeing if there's areas for improvement, seeing if there's upside potential. At the moment, that's probably going to be our, our use of cash um, as well as, you know, rent and small salaries. Um, outside of that, uh, if markets do tend to change, we might review drilling some more on our 100% on ground, as I mentioned, we have numerous targets, and we think um, we think there's significant amount of potential to expand on not only resources but make new discoveries. However, in the market, we've noticed we have noticed that uh, it's not translating that much into new shareholder value in terms of drilling and expanding resources, um, and it could be just a, a just what's happening in the market today. It could be a, a bigger picture, but we, we believe we're getting close to a bottom in the gold cycle. We believe um, that over the last number of years, stewards of shareholder capital management and board of directors and mid-tiers and senior gold companies have started to focus really on the margins of their ounces and being able to really grow, not uh, not so much grow their production, but focus on cash margins of, of, of their producing opportunities within their portfolios. And uh, I think they're really starting to evaluate and starting to put money to work properly. Uh, whereas before it was just, a, um, it was not well used capital allocations. And I think that's what got the sector a little bit offside for a lot of institutional shareholders unhappy with the, with the use of capital. So I think that's changed. I think a lot has cleaned up. I think that, um, yeah, I think that we're getting close to uh, to a new bull market, and we hope so. And uh, we're going to be opportunistic now. How much debt do you have? No debt. Did we miss any ins other institutional investors? No, I don't think so. Um, we we do have, uh, I'm sure, a couple of uh, of different funds in there. Probably equate to about. 10 to 15 percent um, funds that have uh, are familiar with us. I won't name any specific names, but uh, yeah, there's probably about 15, maybe up to 20 percent institutionally held within the company. And what is the float? Oh, the float I would say is probably oh, currently somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the of the public company. Are there any change of control fees? At this stage, I don't believe there is, no. All right. All right, sir. You survived the storm. Mr. King, <laughs> multi-layered question here. What is the next unanswered question for caliber mining? When should we expect results? And what determines success? Great question. Great multi-level question. I will answer that by saying, first and foremost, I think the largest significant impact caliber will have for shareholders will be the acquisition of a producing gold opportunity that has opportunity to either expand in resources or optimize in costs in terms of potentially bringing costs down. So I, th I think that will have the most impact for shareholders to the company. I think it would transform the company, well clearly would transform the company immediately. We do have ongoing drilling with Centera and with IM Gold. Over the next number of months, we'll have drill results coming out periodically. One of the things about drilling, when you're drilling new targets, is you hope to have good success. You never know. And I believe that if we do have good success, significantly outside of our resources, maybe larger widths, higher grade, that could have a very positive impact on the company. So there's a number of things that will, will outline success and I believe it will happen between the next three and let's call it nine months we'll have regular news flow however this uh, opportunity for us to take advantage of the lower price to nav opportunities in the in the in the sector the let's call it hopefully low-hanging fruit um, maybe partner with a mid-tier company to try and unlock value um, you see uh, back in, in in earlier parts of the 2000s Gold Corp had been successful at that. They had vended out projects for shares. Companies um, 
you know, for example, Primero had good success and, and Gold Corp did well on shares there. So there's many different ways to skin a cat. There's many different ways to find new opportunities. Um, our group is very connected with numerous different parties within the sector. So I think we'll have success. I'm very confident we'll have success. Um, and what was the third question? Well, sir, I just want to make sure that we covered when should we expect results and what determines success? And again, what is the next unanswered question? Yeah, I guess the next unanswered question would just be, um, what is the new opportunity? What is it going to look like? Um, we are focused on precious metals, but uh, what, what is it going to look like and how is the team going to unlock value for shareholders? What keeps management up at night that we don't know about? I would say, if anything, what keeps management up at night is not getting into the game. And what I mean by that is not being able to execute on our plan, and that is to acquire something that is either advanced stage or in production. For whatever reason, not being able to acquire it, uh, costs get too expensive, structure doesn't work, um, relationships fall apart, cap <coughs> excuse me, capital isn't there for some reason. So I would say, if anything, we want to get in the game, and we believe that there is a new bull market in precious metals coming. We'd like to get in the game, and if there's anything that keeps us up at night, it would be that, not being able to uh, be a part of the of the next cycle. Finally, what did I forget to ask? What did you forget to ask? Well, we covered off our capital structure. We covered off our shareholders. People follow Rick rules of the world. People follow when management owns a significant chunk of a company. They know that they're also putting money in. People follow well-known mining entrepreneurs, people like Lucas Lundin that own almost 10% of the company. We covered our exploration projects in Nicaragua. We covered our partners. We covered our strategic plan of going out and acquiring new advanced stage or producing gold or silver opportunities. I think we've covered, uh, covered most of the aspects that any sort of retail or institutional shareholder would want to know when looking at a company. Um, I think it's important to note that we're all very engaged here. Uh, we, we do think that there is a great opportunity in front of us. And so um, in terms of what investors would look for, I think we covered off all the important aspects. Mr. King, for someone listening that wants to get more information on Caliber Mining, please share the contact details. Absolutely. You can contact myself directly at 604 Six eight one nine nine four four. That is the office phone number here in Vancouver, Canada. You can email me directly, R King R K I N G at calibermining dot com, as well as of course get information from the website www dot caliber c a l i b r e mining dot com. And I'll also give this, uh, I think it's important to be able to get a hold of somebody uh, when someone's doing research. My personal and, and company cell phone number, 778-998-3700. Uh, I'm available all the time to discuss, to meet with, and to talk to any potential uh, investors or current shareholders. I'm happy to do so. And as a reminder, Caliber Mining trades on the TSXV symbol C. X B and on the OTC symbol C X B M D. And last but not least, please visit our website provenimprobable.com where we interview the most respected names in the natural resource space. You may reach us at contact at provenimprobable.com. Ryan King of Caliber Mining, thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only.
without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.